Hello and welcome to Ogmore by Sea Churches Reading the Bible Together. My name is Dom, I'm the pastor of the church and it's great that you can join me as we read through the book of Esther together. We're reading Daniel and Esther through the month of June 2023. And before we dive in and I give a bit of a, an overview of the book of Esther, a bit of an introduction, we have got a comment on one of our videos from a guy called David. David, if you're watching, thanks for watching and thanks for leaving a comment. Uh, it is a bit of a funny one. Uh, David writes, it's pathetic and embarrassing to think that in the 21st century there are still people so poorly educated and ill-informed that they still take this nonsense seriously. And David, I'm, I'm sorry if you take offence at what we're doing here, uh, but actually what you say is a real encouragement to me for a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, is you can see that we're taking the Bible seriously. It might be nonsense to you, but we're taking it seriously. And that is a real encouragement. And also how you frame it, pathetic and embarrassing, um, is, is actually a real encouragement because the Apostle Paul says that the message of the cross is weakness and foolishness. In other words, pathetic and embarrassing. So it might seem uh, pathetic and embarrassing to us, and it may look that way, but we know Jesus and we know that his message to us is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And I invite you to know Jesus as well and for this revelation to be yours. But uh, thank you for commenting and I'd like to just get in touch and I don't want to shut down this conversation. I want to please, if you've got specific objections or concerns, then please let me know. Um, but yeah, we really do take this uh, nonsense seriously, uh, along with about 2.5 billion other people in the world today. But we really do take it seriously, and thank you for commenting. Right, the book of Esther is what we're going to take seriously now. And this is set at the time when the Jewish nation had been exiled, but it's after the decree had been made for them to return back to Judah and Jerusalem. For whatever reason, Mordecai and his adopted daughter, or I think um, she's his niece, um, Esther, they stay back in Susa, in the Persian Empire, and that's where all this unfolds. It's the book of the Bible that God isn't mentioned, the Lord isn't mentioned. But one key lesson then for us is that God is always at work, whether we can see him, whether people mention him, or not. He is at work bringing good out of the bad. He is the Redeemer and we see through the story of Esther of how the Lord has always brought good out of the bad in his great wisdom and he does that. It's like it's like another Exodus event. It's like, um, yeah, it's, it's another salvation story where the whole nation is saved by the Lord God. Okay, we ought to pray, and then we're going to dive in. And God willing, we're going to read all of Esther together now. So please, would you pray with me? Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth that you've shared with us. And I pray for anyone who might stumble upon this video. And I pray that you would open their eyes to see Jesus for who he is and the life that he offers. And we pray for ourselves. We humble ourselves before you, and we want to hear what you have to say. So we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right. Here we go. Esther chapter 1. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. Uh, a friend of mine has also been reading this with his church and he pointed out that Xerxes crops up in some popular culture. So he crops up in the film 300, which is really gruesome, actually. Um, and it talks about the Spartan army of 300 men who fought against this massive army. And I think that's Xerxes who has the massive army. Um, and he crops up in Assassin's Creed, <laughs> which is a video game. I, I haven't played it. I don't know whether you've played it, but... It's a part of history that uh, crops up time and time again. Um, and it's interesting. But what's to note is 
Xerxes, for all of his earthly power and fame, he's not the focus of attention for the living God, who cherishes what is despised in the world's eyes. So we'll see that he's just a bit part, really, in this. But here he is. He's Xerxes. He was ruling over this massive empire, 127 provinces. Then verse 2, at that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. So he's throwing a massive party. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. That is some party, isn't it? And do you get the impression that he's showing off? Because I do. Verse 5, when these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed gardens of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. So after this <laughs> 180-day festival of him showing off, he has a party to celebrate for another seven days, and it's in this walled garden. Do you know what paradise is? Paradise is a word which means a walled garden. And I think what's going on underneath the surface is that King Xerxes sees himself as a god. And he wants other people to see him as that. Verse 6. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Wine served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. As you go through the list of materials there, if you're familiar with the tabernacle or temple, then you could see some similarities, which is again implying that King Xerxes was trying to make himself out as the center of this religion, really. Yeah, man-made religion. He wanted to take all that imagery and as well as showing off his wealth. And he won verse 8, he places no restrictions on people. And it's been pointed out of how that's kind of what the world is doing, isn't it? Don't stop doing anything. Do whatever you want. Give expression to the real you in, inside yourself. Um, whereas the message of the living God is true freedom, but it's a narrow way. Always having what you want is not what is actually good for you. Verse 9. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zetha, and Carcass, to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. He was drunk, and he had this idea of basically objectifying his wife, the queen, bring her out so everyone can ogle her and marvel at her beauty. He was showing off all his other objects to show off how fortunate he was, or how godlike he was, and he sees Queen Vashti as just another thing, whereas the living God values women, really gives them the dignity they deserve. Um, yeah, it's not a good idea though, is it? Verse 12, but when the attendants delivered the king's command, 
Queen Vashti refused to come. So you can kind of understand that, but the phrase either very brave or very stupid comes to mind. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. So fair play to Queen Vashti standing up to this this despot. She is not on board with this and she says no, but fury unfolds because of it. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times and were closest to the king. Kashina, Shitha, Admatha, Tarshish, Merez, Marcina, and Memukin, the seven nobles of Persia and Media who had special access to the king and were highest in the kingdom. According to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti? he asked. She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken that the eunuchs have taken to her. Then Memukin replied, in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and the peoples of all the provinces of King Xerxes, for the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, and so they will despise their husbands, husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then, when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. They're concerned that her example is going to be followed by the other women, <laughs> which is probably a good thing if the men are behaving like King Xerxes. <laughs> such an u ugly uh, character, isn't he? Um, and it's such an ugly outcome. But there we go. Uh, but on another level, what is going on here is, uh, for, for all of King Xerxes' failings, I think there is something deep, if we dig, in terms of responding to authority. So if the one in authority gives us an opportunity and we turn it down, then, uh, yeah, for, for that authority to not give the invitation again seems fair, maybe? <laughs> Am I wrong in justifying King Xerxes? Can you see something of a fairness here? So even though King Xerxes was drunk, he was showing off and objectifying Queen Vashti and all that, uh, all that wrongness, he commanded her to come into his presence and then she, she defies that command and therefore the judgment is Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. So it's like you've had your chance and you've lost it to ever come into his presence again. Is it just me or is there some kind of semblance of a logic behind that? Anyway, verse 21. The king and his nobles were pleased with this advice, so the king did as Memukin proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, and to each people in their own language, proclaiming that every man should be ruler over his own household using his native tongue. Sin leads to more sin. Isn't that a principle in life? And you see this with wars, you see this with arguments between individuals, that if someone acts sinfully towards another person, 
then it provokes a greater response, a, a, a wrong response, doesn't it? And the cycle continues and it gets worse and worse. So people might end up not speaking for decades and it's over some stupidly trivial thing. And yeah, I guess there are wars where each side say, well, they did this, well, they did that. And it just escalates. Sin leads to more sin. It is the grace of Jesus that cuts that cycle. Because it says that the living God has not treated us as we deserve, but has forgiven us. So his grace breaks in to that cycle in our own lives. And as we receive the forgiveness of Jesus that he purchased with his blood, then that is also the power for us to break the cycle, to graciously break the cycle of um, responding when, when we are mistreated to uh, retaliating with greater force. It says, no, love your enemies, do good to those who, uh, who persecute you. It's only grace that breaks the cycle of escalating sin. Chapter 2. Later, when King Xerxes' fury had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. So it seems like the morning after now, doesn't it? The party's over. He's taken a paracetamol and he's having a bit of a moment remembering Queen Vashti, what she had done and what he had done in response. Maybe he's having second thoughts. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful young women into the har harem, harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Hegai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the young women, young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. So maybe in his mind he was having second thoughts, thinking, oh, what have I done? And then there's this proposal which lures him away from repenting at all and recognising that he's done wrong. In, instead, uh, it's this lustful proposal, isn't it? It's this massive, earthwide beauty pageant to find the next queen. Objectifying women. Jesus has something far better. Um, yeah. Who was it that had the privilege of seeing Jesus first after he was risen from the dead? It was Mary. It was Mary. At a time when the testimony of a woman wasn't even valid in, in the human courts, it was Mary that Jesus wanted to show himself to. He, he um, recognises her testimony. Yeah. But a whole lot of objectification going on here. Verse 5. Now there was in the citadel Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, named Mordecai, son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadne Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiachin, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father, father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. So there we go. Mordecai is cousins with Hadassah, 
who is called Esther. And she was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Hegai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Hegai, who had charge of the harem. She pleased him and won his favour. Immediately he provided her with her beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place in the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. So my friend seems to think that Mordecai and Esther had um, forsaken their, their Jewish background. They had acclimatised to living in the Persian Empire. Maybe they were comfortable and they didn't want to be known that they were Jewish. Um, I wonder whether there's something else going on. We're not told the reason why they stayed behind when others returned from the exile, and we're not told why they had hidden it. Um, it's a possibility. But, uh, yeah, there could be other reasons. Maybe Mordecai was, um, had some kind of illness, and he, need, he couldn't travel. Maybe there are other reasons. Maybe they had such a, a faith in the living God of the heavens and the earth. They saw through the passing images of Judah and Jerusalem. Maybe they sent their blessing and gave what they could and had their calling to stay. I mean, they're certainly used by the Lord in their context in Susa. But just because the Lord uses them there and has a plan for them, yeah, we're not told. I'm not going to pass judgment on them. Verse 11. Every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. It's got to be an awful situation, isn't it? And they're basically um, taking young women from their homes uh, it seems it's just like dominating that it's just like saying right you need to come this is what's happening and it's not like everyone else who wasn't um successful going through this whole beauty pageant were released and sent back they were just there it's awful isn't it yeah terrible so mordecai was there lingering around trying to find out how his adopted daughter was. I can't imagine. Verse 12. Before a young woman's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh, and six months with perfumes and cosmetics. I've, <laughs> I've heard of women taking a long time to get ready <laughs> but that is quite something isn't it <laughs> I don't think it was by choice either verse 13 and this is how she would go to the king anything she wanted was given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace in the evening she would go there and in the morning return to another part of the harem to, to the care of Sheash Gaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. They're pretty helpless, aren't they? The women are just being um, treated as if they're puppets, ferried around, given whatever treatments. It's awful. 
Verse 15. When the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Hegai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favour of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the tenth month, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And it's important uh, about the point about the date, because this story is explaining a specific festival that we'll get onto in a couple of chapters' time, um, which remembers and honours what uh, happens in the story. <coughs> Verse 17. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favour and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. So there we go. Just so happens, Esther wins the beauty pageant. It's something I'm not sure whether you'd really want to win it. <laughs> but there we go. What other choice did she have? And the point is, God's not even mentioned. It's this situation where you think, where is God in all this? Is he still at work? When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. But Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to do, for she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions, as she had done when, she was, when he was bringing her up. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were impaled on poles. That's the first of a few impale, impalings. Pretty gruesome stuff. All this was recorded in the Book of the Annals in the presence of the king. So Mordecai saved the king's life by making this plot known through Queen Esther, but she gave credit to Mordecai. There was this conspiracy to kill him. Was Mordecai honoured after these events? Was Mordecai recognised and honoured by King Xerxes? King Xerxes honoured Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honour higher than all the other nobles. So Ag Agagites are um, part of the Amorites, I think, the Amorites, the Canaanite uh, clan, and historically they have been at war with God's people. Uh, that's not to say that some of them uh, didn't join God's people, but I think the liter literary device going on here is, for the Jewish audience, they'll have their ears pricking up and thinking, oh right, this is a bad guy. And I'm told that when this is read at Purim, the annual festival that the, the Jewish people celebrate, um, it would be a bit like a pantomime, and when Haman is mentioned, they would literally boo and hiss. But the Agagite, that, yeah, is meant to set that expectation. There's a contrast, isn't it, between Mordecai and Haman. You would expect Mordecai to be honoured, but out comes Haman, seemingly out of nowhere, and he gets honour. Verse 2, all the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honour to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honour. Yeah, uh, as we've read through Daniel, we've heard of the bravery and the loyalty of Daniel and his three mates, not bowing down to anyone else. 
And yeah, here we have Mordecai not bowing down to Haman. Brave, stupid, but loyal to his God. Verse 3. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behaviour would be tolerated, for he had told them he was a Jew. So here we go. <clears throat> he hasn't kept it a secret. And maybe um, he was happy just to get along, but they were pressing him for a reason as to why he doesn't bow down. And then the explanation, the reason for the hope that is in him, he belongs to Jesus. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honour, he was enraged. Haman comes across as a very needy and fragile individual, doesn't he? He's crying over the fact that Mordecai doesn't lick the earth before him. Yet, having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Pretty extreme. And it's something that has happened a number of times throughout history. It's like God sets his love on a particular people and... It's like Satan can't deal with that and so seeks to destroy what the Lord loves and who the Lord loves. And there's this ongoing theme as well, because back in Genesis 3, when the Lord pronounces uh, the curses, um, curses on the serpent, Satan is told that the seed of the woman will crush your head. And by doing so, will and um, yes, yeah, Satan will strike his heel. He will strike his heel, and he will crush your head. And it's talking about Christ. So it's the Christ will come, and that promise gets focused down into Abraham's family, and then Judah's family, and then David's family. So this messianic savior will come through this particular family. And so Satan, through every means, is trying to get rid of this family. There's this war going on down through the ages. Right up to King Herod at a time when Jesus was born. That's all part of this great theme that we read of here in Esther. Haman's hatred of the Jewish nation. Ah... Uh, And it's, it's nothing personal. Well, maybe it was something a bit personal as well. But Mordecai is just honouring the Lord and obeying his God by not bowing to Haman. But Haman hates Mordecai for his faithfulness to Jesus. Verse 7. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes in the first month, the month of Nisan, the pur, that is the lot, was cast in the presence of Haman to select a day and month, and the lot fell on the twelfth month the month of Ada. So that's a key part of, uh, of the, what's going on in this big story. Uh, pure, that's the root for Purim. Um, so this whole annual festival, which remembers uh, the, the uh, planned destruction of the Jewish people and then their salvation, spoiler alert, um, is to do with, yeah, the lot being cast into the lap. <coughs> And so it's called Purim. Verse 8. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all other people, and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it, if it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them, and I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators 
for the Royal Treasury. <coughs> so a great personal cost, he wants to destroy God's people. It's like <coughs> an anti-Christ. It is the, the upside-down Jesus, <coughs> who, because Jesus, at great personal cost, comes to save God's people. <coughs> but Haman pays the price trying to destroy them. <clears throat> Verse 10, so the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. I think a, a few more questions, probably sensible when someone's talking about genocide. <laughs> Again, doesn't really show King Xerxes in a good light, does it? Then on the 13th day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people all Haman's order, orders to the king's satraps, the governors of the various provinces and the nobles of the various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. Imagine. <laughs> Churns the stomach, doesn't it? <clears throat> and there is a proper overkill with Haman here, isn't it? The order is to destroy, kill and annihilate. He really is like a grumpy toddler with far, far too much power. The couriers went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the city of, in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, <laughs> makes sense to be bewildered by this edict. Um, I just said that Haman had far too much power. But who is really at work in all this. Will Haman's evil plan turn out as he wants it to? Or if he's, is he, unbeknownst to him, serving a different purpose? Chapter four, are you still with me? We're gonna do it, we're gonna get through it. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Now, when people lay in sackcloth and ashes and fast and cry out to the Lord, the Lord hears. The living God hears prayer. And it's not the end of the story. But being told it's not the end of the story when you're in the middle of the story doesn't really do much good for our troubled souls, does it? When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Esther seems concerned about Mordecai uh, embarrassing her. <laughs> Verse 5, then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So it seems... Esther doesn't know about the edict and command. 
So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed, passed since I was called to go to the king. So Esther wants Mordecai to realise that any time going to the king, your life is on the line. She would be risking her life to do this. But what's more is that he hasn't cared about her for the last 30 days. So what's the chances that she is going to be accepted, that her life is going to be spared? It's risky. Verse 12, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your family, father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. There's loads that we could talk about there. Um... And I just want to make a couple of brief comments. So Mordecai is saying to Esther, don't think that you'll escape just because you're in the palace. In fact, so I guess the temptation for Esther is to disown her family and her people. But that's not an option. So if it comes about that this genocide happens, then Esther would not be spared, Mordecai says. But then Mordecai goes on and he seems to see with the eyes of faith beyond this edict. He, he says that relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. So our God is a saviour. He, hear, he hears and he acts in power and Either you can get on board with it and you can be the means by which God redeems and rescues or else you can miss out. And there is this uh, parallel going on. So either you can be the means to save or the rest of God's people will be saved, but you will be judged. And then there's this amazing phrase, which is one of my favourites from this whole book. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. He's, he looks at all the circumstances and how it's all coming together. And he can recognise God's hand in bringing Esther to this place, maybe so that she would be able to intervene intercede for her people and yeah God is at work in your life whether you know it or not he is there are particular specific things that he has called you to do there are things that only you can do he has brought you to a place today where you are who you are so that you would know the Lord and that you would do what only you can do. Verse 15. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. So is she going to disown her own people, try to make her on her own and be saved from the judgment itself? Or is she going to uh, is she going to stand with her people and try to be the means of their salvation? Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. 
Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Fair play to Esther. She's got to be one of the bravest saints that we read of in the Bible. King Xerxes does not have a fantastic track record, does he? And she's uh, very self-aware and she's very wise in understanding the situation and she knows the danger. You can tell that she's that kind of people person who can read situations so well. And she knows that her life is on the line. She knows what she's going to do. And all the Jews there gather together and they fast, a complete fast, not eating or drinking, night or day, for three days. I think the human body can only go three days without water before being seriously dehydrated. It's dangerous. <clears throat> but fasting, as I think I've mentioned before, is <clears throat> a God-given way of expressing our prayer and magnifying, amplifying it. It's to, yeah, it's connected to prayer. It gives weight to the petition. Verse 17. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. Notice it's the third day. The things that happen on the third day or third year or whatever, third time, it is often new life. It's, uh, it's the third day becomes the first day of a whole new era. And it was the third day when Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, what's he going to do? He was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So she doesn't come out with it straight away. She invites the king and Haman to a banquet. And she really does seem to... She, she is uh, as innocent as a dove and as wise as a serpent. That's what Jesus calls us to be. <laughs> I listened to a brilliant sermon on... Uh, that passage when Jesus teaches us to be uh, innocent as doves and as wise as serpents. And the guy uh, said, often we can be the other way around. <laughs> we can be as innocent as serpents as as wise as doves. <laughs> oh dear. And that's stuck with me, as you can tell. But Esther here, she's using her noggin. So the king and Haman... And that's interesting, isn't it, that um, she's full of trust in the Lord. They're depending on the Lord in prayer, but that doesn't mean she can disengage her brain. In fact, she's trying her best and doing her, yeah, doing her very best with her own efforts. It's, it's both, isn't it? It's complete trust and to work because you believe that the Lord is at work in and through you and around you. Yeah. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, Esther knew that King Xerxes liked his wine. The king asked, again asked Esther, Now what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, My petition and my request is this. 
if the king regards me with favour and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfil my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else get a bit suspicious when someone is being really, really kind to you? <laughs> you think, what have you got to say to me? What are you trying to soften? <laughs> yeah, what what are you sugarcoating? But anyway, uh, fair play to Esther. She knows what she's doing. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits, but when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honoured him and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave, and she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. It would be a struggle to be a friend or the wife of Haman, wouldn't it? <laughs> Sat down. What do you want to talk about, Haman? Oh, you want to talk about how great you are and how much money you have again. Okay. <laughs> Deary me. Incredibly selfish. His wife, Zeresh, and all his friends said to him, have a pole set up reaching to a height of 50 cubits, which is pretty big. If I was to click on that, I still haven't sorted it out so you can't see the footnote, but... It says about 75 feet or 23 meters. That is pretty big. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. Oh, so, and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. This, suggest, this suggestion delighted Haman and he had the pole set up. Yeesh, delighted. <laughs> Such an ugly thing to be delighted over, isn't it? But we'll see how the tables will turn. It's like the Abrahamic blessing. Jesus told Abraham, those who bless you will be blessed, those who curse you will be cursed. That is being played out. But it's, at the moment, it's just escalating the amount of curse that is going on Mordecai and the Jewish people. That night, the king could not sleep. So he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found, recorded there, that Mordecai had exposed Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. So King Xerxes, he can't sleep. Hopefully you are not asleep right now, <laughs> but he wants to do a bit of bedtime reading. He has a story read to him, uh, and it's, well, it's actually <laughs> the story of his courts, the annals of the, yeah, of the king. It was read, and he hears about how Mordecai had exposed this conspiracy. He had saved the king's life. Verse 3, what honour and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him. His attendants answered. The king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai in the pole he had set up for him. His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. You know in sitcoms where you have like all the different events uh, building up to have like it's usually this big cringeworthy moment or like this big reveal at the end where it all makes sense. It's all building up isn't it and now we're going to see how things start panning out. Bring him in. When Haman 
entered, the king asked him, What should be done for the man the king delights to honour? And the king had been honouring Haman for whatever reason before this. And Haman is incredibly self-centred and he loves to talk about how he's honoured by the king and Queen Esther and is really rich. So now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honour than me? So he answered the king, for the man the king delights to honour, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a, and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honour and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. So he doesn't hold back, does he? Selfishly, he's like, oh, this is what I'd love to do. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai, the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. <laughs> and remember, the king doesn't know about Mordecai, uh, doesn't know about the beef between Haman and Mordecai. He's just really unwittingly, because Haman didn't explain about Mordecai, and that's what the reason why he wants to destroy the Jews. He comes up with this uh, justification that they keep separate and they don't obey the king's commands and all that. So he doesn't share all the info. So this is... This is a God incidence, isn't it? One that you might think is a coincidence, but there is far more going on, isn't there? There is God bringing good out of the bad. He is turning the tables uh, in such a perfect way. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him... This is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. <laughs> Wonder how enthusiastically he proclaimed that message. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate. I wonder how Mordecai felt as well. It must have been uh, pretty awkward. <laughs> but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Oh, poor you. <laughs> his advisers and his wife, Zeresh, said to him, Since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared. Can things get any worse? So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet, and as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favour with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition, and spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. Esther said, An adversary and enemy, this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realising that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Habal, Harbona, 
one of the eunuchs attending the king said, A pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had it set up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. And the king's fury subsided. Esther pictures Jesus in this story, interceding for God's people, bravely standing with them, even at risk to her life. Of course, it was the cost of Jesus' life for our salvation. But also, Haman as a mirror image of Jesus. Yeah, teaches us about Jesus. Haman is like the Antichrist. <clears throat> he is a antichrist. He uh, he wants to pay in order to destroy God's people, whereas Jesus sacrifices himself for God's people, for their life, for their salvation. And Haman sets up this pole to destroy Mordecai, where it's Jesus who hangs on a pole to save God's people. But Haman, so there's the Old Testament law that says, cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree. And that includes being impaled. And you're meant to read the story and you're meant to boo and hiss and think how awful Haman is and that he's getting what he deserves, which is utter curse. To, for God to be against him. But the point is that our lives are cursed. And so for our redemption, the, the blameless one, the holy one of God, hung on the tree on our behalf so that there would be peace between us and God. Chapter 8, are you still with me? Are you still awake? Okay. That same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, and Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how, for Esther had told how he was related to her. So it's all coming together. It's like the fairy tale ending, isn't it? The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai, and Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. Esther again pleaded with the king. Falling at his feet and weeping, she begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman, the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. It's all well and good, Haman being impaled, but there's still the edict that he had... Uh, Proclaimed, isn't it? So the disaster still hasn't been averted. The baddie had been defeated, but the destruction hasn't been averted. Then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she arose and stood before him. So that's a little verse, isn't it? A, a little, but she's risking her life again because the the law still stands, doesn't it? About all that she said before how dangerous it was to come into the king's presence. And there had been this massive upheaval and disruption caused by her. So, but she still goes. There is still the need. So she bravely goes in to plead with the king again to resolve it. Verse 5, if it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favour and thinks it the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given his estate to Esther, and they have impaled him on the pole he set up. 
Now, write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews, as seems best to you, and seal it with the king's signet ring. For no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. Is this whole idea that he is playing God, isn't it? It comes up a couple of times in, in uh, Daniel, where Darius says he can't go back on the, the command of the king. Um, yeah, the Medes and the Persians and all that. You can. They could. If they were just to simply confess and own up that they are not God. <laughs> it's a good thing to regularly remember that I am not God. You are not God. We say things and sometimes we need to apologise for them. We sometimes need to eat our words. But for whatever reason, the arrogance, whatever, King Xerxes wouldn't. At once the royal secretaries were summoned. On the 23rd day of the third month, the month of Sivan, they wrote out all Mordecai's orders to the Jews and to the satraps, governors and nobles of the 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. These orders were written in the script of each province in the language of each people and also to the Jews in their own script and language. Mordecai wrote in the name of King Xerxes, sealed the dispatches with the king's signet ring and sent them by mounted couriers who rode fast horses especially bred for the king. It is urgent. And it's got exactly the same weight as Haman's evil decree. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to, the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them and their women and children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. The day appointed for the Jews to do this in all the province, provinces of King Xerxes was the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers riding the royal horses went out spurred on by the king's command and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. When Mordecai left the king's presence, he was wearing royal garments of blue and white, a large crown of gold and a purple robe of fine linen. And the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. For the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honour. In every province and in every city to which the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews, with feasting and celebrating. And many people of, the, of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. Hmm. They can see that God is at work. Okay. Another chapter. Chapter 9. On the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, it's crunch time now, isn't it? The edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. But now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities in all the provinces, provinces of King Xerxes to attack those determined to destroy them. No one could stand against them because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. Do all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors and the king's administrators helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces. He became more and more powerful. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. They also killed Parshandatha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Poratha, Adeliah, Aridatha, Parmashta, Arisai, Aridai, and 
Vezatha, the ten sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they did not lay their hands on the plunder. This reminds me of the Exodus event, how God saves through judgment. Um, it's a complete role reversal. The tables are turned and Israel are brought out. There is destruction. God's people are saved. It also reminds me of the conquest of the promised land. Once they've been brought in there with Joshua leading them. Because they were commanded to destroy these nations. But they were not to keep the plunder. And there was a chap that is name is starts with an a what's his name he goes and takes some of the plunder and hides it in his he buries it in his tent oh i can't remember his name but yeah this reminds me of that um i mean maybe you've got questions about how gruesome and bloodthirsty all this is how does this match up with a god of love well, the short answer is, if God is love and people hate him, then and hate and hurt others, then what is the, the right response? What's the loving response? If someone is coming to attack my family, what's the loving thing for me to do for my family? It's to protect them, isn't it? God is love in that God the Father loves God the Son, the unity of the Spirit. And if people hate Jesus, so there's that. Also God's children, God's people, God's world and, and all this. If there is hurt and destruction, in Psalm 51 it makes the connection that all sin is ultimately rebellion against God. There's an awful lot of collateral damage. That's not to minimise the wrong and the hurt, the unspeakably so, to other people. That is, of course, true. But it's the living God that all this rebellion is ultimately directed towards. And so what is the loving response that the that the Lord in his justice will do. So there will be peace, there will be life and salvation, and there's the principle taught by Jesus, do to others as you would have done to you, and that's a principle that the Lord Jesus in his justice applies. So as you have done to others, it will be done to you. There is a, a justice here. And this is literally playing out that divine justice. That these people who wanted to kill the Jewish people are now they themselves being killed. So it might make us squirm. But hopefully we can see the fairness of it. I think I've mentioned Wiley Coyote in the Looney Tunes before. You know how he's always like trying to blow up Roadrunner? And the, how it pans out is he ends up getting blown up in the face. And you're like, that's what you deserve. God gives people what they deserve unless we belong to Jesus through faith, in which case the judgment has landed on him, my king. Right, where do we get up to? Where did we get up to? But they did not lay hands on the plunder, that's where we got up to, because it reminded me of I can't remember his name. What is his name? It starts with an A. 
please write in the comments. You know who I'm talking about. I think it was after Jericho, wasn't it? <sighs> Verse 11. The number of those killed in the city of Susa was reported to the king that, that same day. The king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and the sons of Haman in the citadel of Susa. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? It will be granted. If it pleases the king, Esther answered, give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also and let Haman's ten sons be impaled on poles. <clears throat> What's going on there? Is Esther being vindictive? Is she now power hungry? Has she been sucked into this vortex of violence? Or is it something akin to the Apostle Paul when he's imprisoned, knowing without any charge, knowing that he's a Roman citizen, and then he gets the he gets the the rulers of the city to come out and to publicly vindicate him. I think that's what's going on here. Esther wants the protection of her people to be complete. She wasn't content for just the judgment to fall on Haman whilst his edict still stood. She needed to deal with that, and with Mordecai's help, that was dealt with. But I think she sees that she wants a complete protection and it to be publicly known and remembered. And so this is like bringing it to the to the extreme, so that that would be the case. <clears throat> so the king commanded that this be done. An edict was issued in Susa, and they impaled the ten sons of Haman. The Jews in Susa came together on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar, and they put to death in Susa three hundred men but they did not lay hands on the plunder. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hand on, hands on the plunder. This happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. The Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the 13th and 14th, and then on the 15th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. That is why rural Jews, those living in villages, observe the 14th of the month of Ada as a day of joy and feasting, a day for giving presents to each other. Mordecai recorded these events. And he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes near and far to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. That's what my God does he brings joy out of sorrow and he turns mourning into celebration and he's done it in Jesus he wrote them to he wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor sounds a bit like christmas doesn't it God's goodness is contagious. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. It's interesting, it's like a life-giving edict. Here's a command. For Haman, son of Hamaditha, Ham I can't say, ham -e datha the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the pur, that is the lot, 
for their ruin and destruction. But when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head, and that he and his sons should be impaled on poles. Therefore these days were called Purim, from the word pure, or pur. Because of everything written in this letter, and because of what they had seen and what had happened to them, the Jews took it on themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all and all who joined them should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family and in every province and in every city. And these days of Purim should never fail to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of these days die out among their descendants. So Queen Esther, daughter of Abihail, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter concerning Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews in the 127 provinces of Xerxes' kingdom, words of goodwill and assurance, to establish these days of Purim at their designate, designated times, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had decreed for them, and as they had established for themselves and their descendants in regard to their times of fast, fasting and lamentation. Esther's decree confirmed these regulations about Purim, and it was written down in the records. King Xerxes imposed tributes throughout the empire to its distant shores, and all his acts of power and might together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai, whom the king had promoted, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Media and Persia? That is reminiscent of uh, 1 and 2 Chronicles and 1 and 2 Kings, isn't it? Uh, summing up, or more Chronicles, I think. Yeah. Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews. So he comes to stand in a similar place, place that Joseph did in Egypt, that Daniel did in Babylon, Mordecai and Esther in Persia. It begs the question, who is really in control? The lot is cast into the lap, but its every outcome is from the Lord. Amen. Thank you for joining me. God bless and see you again soon.